It's really my distinct pleasure to introduce Andrew Hacker, although I know that many of you on the webinar already know him. Andrew Hacker has spent his academic career teaching undergraduates in the political science departments of Queens College, where he's currently a professor emeritus, and before that at Cornell University. Some of you on this webinar may know that Mr. Hacker is an extremely popular professor, despite being demanding and asking that his students be critical thinkers, do a lot of reading and complete all of the assignments. And for those of us who teach undergraduates, we know that has a tendency to uh, affect your enrollments, not for Mr. Hacker. Mr. Hacker's also chosen to be a public intellectual. He's written over 10 books and is a contributor to the New York Review of Books, The Atlantic and Nation, among many, many other popular publications. He is also the author, and I mention this because it's so timely, but he wrote this book in 1992. It was a New York Times bestseller. It's called Two Nations, Black and White, Separate, Hostile, Unequal. And after you read Downfall, I suggest you go out and purchase Two Nations. It's a very, very important book. Mr. Hacker received his BA from Amherst College and his PhD from Princeton University. Before we start our book conversation, please allow me just a brief point of personal privilege. It's not really very often that anyone gets to acknowledge and then publicly thank the person who changed the course of their life. So for me, the first order of business is to th say, thank you, Mr. Hacker for being the professor at Queens College who challenged me, encouraged me, and inspired me. And thank you for staying in my life and continuing to be a mentor and a friend. And thank you for writing books and articles that challenge all Americans to examine their preconceived notions and personal biases and even their conceptions of American history. And thank you for helping us all understand our responsibilities as citizens in a democracy. It's more important now than ever. Okay, thank you for indulging me, folks, on this webinar, but I couldn't let it go by without expressing my appreciation to Mr. Hacker. And I hope I didn't embarrass you too much, but I know that's kind of impossible at this stage in life. So, You're very welcome. <laughs> I used to call you at Queens College, Miss Fuchs. Miss Fuchs, right. So if you notice, I'll be calling Mr. Hacker, Professor Hacker, Andrew Hacker, Mr. Hacker for this entire webinar because that is what I called him in college and that is what I seem to have to continue to call him. <laughs> so the first question, it's clear from the title of your book, downfall, the demise of a president and his party, that you expect Donald Trump to be a one-term president. You wrote in the book, and you wrote it before the Democrats chose Joe Biden to go up against Trump, and you stated that any Democrat could beat Trump. So Mr. Hacker, what makes you so sure that Democrats will turn out in sufficient numbers and in the right states to ensure a victory in the Electoral College. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, as a, I finished the book before the Democrats had chosen their candidate. But I said, it didn't matter. Winnie the Pooh could run as a Democrat and the Democrat would still win. Now, why do I say this? It's not just a prediction, this is an absolute certainty. And by the way, uh, the book went to press before the virus came around, before unemployment came around. I was still sure back then. I'll tell you why. And here, I'm going to do some homage to Columbia University. Almost a century ago, there was a very distinguished professor of psychology at Columbia named Robert Woodworth. And he had a very simple approach. It was called behaviorism. And he said, don't listen to people. Don't ask people questions. Just watch what they do. And I've always remembered that. 
So that's the basis of my book. It's not what people have said to polls, not what voters have said, I prefer Biden over uh, Trump or anything like that. But I watch how they vote because voting is an action. It's a form of behavior. Hey, it could be waiting in the, out in the rain for three quarters of an hour or waiting for three hours with the virus around you. Or if you're at home, in some states, you have to find a postage stamp. Hey, you sure you have a stamp in your house? Or even if it's prepaid, hey, is there a mailbox near you? It takes a lot of effort to vote. So I watch how people are voting. And what I discovered in writing the book was that if you look at voting post-2016, in other words, after Donald Trump was got elected, we now know how the American people, voting Americans, have reacted to Donald Trump. One of the things I did was I examined over a dozen special elections. These were special elections for House of Representative seats in states like Kansas, Utah, South Carolina. Nobody paid any attention to them. But I found they were tea leaves you could read. And what I found in these special elections was that Republicans were staying home. And even in Kansas, Democrats were turning out as they never had before. And I said, something's going on there. Particularly, 62 million people turned out to vote for Donald Trump. Almost all of them were Republicans. Why weren't they voting in the special elections? But then we came to the 2018 midterm elections. We all know about that. And we say, okay, we now have Nancy Pelosi back. The Democrats swept the House of Representatives. But there was more than that. Here are the tea leaves again. Remember, about 62 people voted, 62 million people voted for Donald Trump. 12 million of them stayed home at the midterms. Republicans generally don't stay home at the midterm. How come the 12 million Republicans stayed at home? They were supposed to vote for members of the House of Representatives, Republicans. They didn't. Whereas almost every Democrat who turned out for Hillary Clinton turned out in the 2008 midterms. Now, what were the midterms about? They weren't about electing members of the House of Representatives. They weren't about health care or immigration or even the wall. The midterms were a referendum on Donald John Trump. That's why 60 million Democrats turned out. They wanted to vote Trump out. But interestingly, only 50 million Republicans, many fewer, you know, uh, turned out to support Trump. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that they're turning to be Democrats, but what it means is that Donald Trump's so-called base has dwindled as a president's base as never before. Now, this is really very interesting because there's no question that Trump kind of did not come out of the mainstream of the Republican Party. And yet he had, as you, as you mentioned in your first remarks, he created a very strong base and, it, and you are suggesting now that it's dwindling. So I, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about this relationship as you do in the book between Donald Trump and the Republican Party itself and the agenda of the Republican Party. Does he really reflect longstanding positions held by the Republicans? Or has he really been a leader in solidifying a new set of policy proposals? Um, and the Republicans are sort of following behind him. Um, I don't know, is he a reflection of the party leadership in his base or has he really created something slightly different here to win? The, the simple answer is none of the above. <laughs> How did Donald Trump get his 62 million votes? It's because almost all the Republicans who had turned out for Mitt Romney turned out again for Donald Trump. They weren't voting for Trump. They wanted a Republican in the White House. 
They were tired of eight years of a Democrat, Obama. It's our turn now. And they would have elected their own Winnie the Pooh as <laughs> a Republican just to get the Republican in. And I went over state by state, district by district, and these nice suburban college educated Republicans still voted for Donald Trump. And by the way, here's something rather interesting about it. When they were polled by Gallup and all the others, a lot of these Republicans didn't admit to the pollster they were voting for Donald Trump. Now, this is rather curious. They don't know who the pollster is. Why is it? Hmm. Well, actually, they're a bit ashamed about doing it, but they still went out and voted because they wanted a Republican president, and they got it. So that was his base. It was a big base, 62 million. But as I pointed out, it's down to 50 million, and it's going to be, I suspect, even lower than that come November 3rd. So this is very interesting, I think. Your thesis really uh, depends upon Republicans essentially either flipping or not showing up, and Democrats showing up in greater numbers than they did uh, for in the in the 2016 presidential race. And of course, you know, we have 2018 midterms, so that's a compelling, compelling piece of your argument. But in the end, what what's really happening that will make these Republicans decide it's okay not to have a Republican president and elect a Democrat. If in fact, they managed to vote for him the first time knowing a lot about his character and his positions. Okay, the first is that yes, they voted for him in 62, but they didn't turn out in the 2018 referendum on him. Something else about the Democrats. People who, I don't even speak about Democrats. I talk about Republicans all the time, and a large section of the book is about Republicans. Right. Very few people are Democrats, but a lot of people vote Democratic. And here's the, the high point in recent years was Barack Obama, 2008. He got 65 million votes back then from a lot of white people who were never even thought of voting for a black man. And they did. They voted Democratic back then. Those people are still around, those 65 million. Now, let me play the demographer. The country has grown. The eligible electorate has grown. The 65 million back in 2008 is now equivalent to 75 million today. I would not be surprised if the Democratic candidate, what's his name? Biden? Hmm. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Winnie the Pooh. The Democratic candidate will get 70 million votes. Not Democrats as such, but 70 million people want to get rid of Donald John Trump. It's as simple as that. Now, you mentioned earlier, should I take a minute about the Electoral College? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, this is Poli Sci 101, uh, you know, all about the Electoral College. Um, and I can't spend that much time on it, but one of the things about the Electoral College is not just small states, but that Democrats cast a lot of what we call wasted votes. In other words, all those votes in California, Illinois, New York, the order Democrats, those huge majorities don't count because you only need one vote to carry a state. But let's get down to 2020. In 2016, Donald Trump became president by carrying those three famous, infamous states. We all know them by heart. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And how many votes did he carry those three states together? Virtually everybody knows, 77,000. <laughs> That's how he carried them. Okay, Why did, how can we carry them? It was mainly because Democrats stayed home not because that many Republicans turned out. But now let's fast forward to 2018. Midterm election, apparently not as big a turnout. 
those three states, Democrats carried them. For example, they elected three governors. You know what the margin was of those three states, Democrats? 1.3 million. In other words, Democrats carried those three states by 1.3 million votes. That's almost 15 times as many votes as Trump won by. So those states are in the bag for the Democrats. There's no problem about that. And as a result, they're going to carry the Electoral College. Now, here's the one problem for Democrats in the Electoral College. And it's the one that Hillary Clinton faced. Due to the way the college is set up, a Democrat must get at least of the two-party vote, 52% of the vote. It, in other words, you have to win 52-48 for a Democrat to end up with the Electoral College. Hillary only got 51%. Right. We talk about how she was three, three million ahead of Donald Trump. Only three million? She should have been five or six million ahead, and she would have walked through the Electoral College. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, of the popular vote, got 55%, 54%. Okay, the current candidate, what's his name? Biden. Nobody's <laughs> Biden. No, they're going to vote against Trump. Biden will get 55% and sweep the Electoral College. It's as simple as that. Why? Because I'm extrapolating from the 208 midterms. Well, my colleague Bob Shapiro uh, has a question, so I'll intervene here because it's on point of the Electoral College. And um, he's asked really whether or not um, the Democrats will have to win any of the states that they, the states that they lost in 2016, particularly will they need Florida and Arizona? Uh, okay. Uh, in fact, if they carry the three infamous states mm -hmm. lost before, they'll carry the Electoral College. What, here's how it works. For every percentage that Democrats get more, let's say 52%, 53 54 they carry another few states because each of those popular margins, as they increase, bring in voters from purple states and enough to carry the purple state. So I am happy to predict that Arizona will certainly go Democratic. I have a good hunch that Iowa will and that Florida will, and there'll be a Democratic Senate. If you get 55% of the vote, which is what Obama did, you get the Senate as well. But okay, I have another webinar member here wanting to follow up on this. Um, there's such a thing in political science anyway, as incumbency advantage. And, and it's pointed out that Obama was able to win in 2012, um, even though he had been in very bad shape uh, as he entered that election, uh, lost the midterm, obviously, lost the House. So why can't Trump repeat that? Uh, here's my analogy for Trump, if we want to say. He's incumbent. Shall I give you the names of some other incumbents? William Howard Taft, <laughs> Herbert Hoover, Gerald Ford, hey, the senior George Bush. Four Republican incumbents, all one-term presidents. Are we going to compare? Uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump with uh, Barack Obama? No, Donald Trump is much more the Herbert Hoover and William Howard Taft of our time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's something compelling about what you're saying, considering that all the those one-term presidents were uh, Republicans, but there was, uh, yeah, Democrats do that also, obviously. Jimmy Carter did it. Um, so... I, I'm, I'm worried about incumbency advantage, and I'm also wondering whether or not you've thought about, you know, the current crises that have emerged since your book was published. So uh, we have the COVID pandemic, and we've got a huge economic recession. We've got 
Black Lives Matters protests, all of these converging together uh, before this election, a lot of unease. Uh, why wouldn't the electorate just kind of try and stay the course, usually during crises, you know, voters don't like to get rid of their leadership in, in, a, in the United States. Uh, I suppose that's one political science theory. It's one. <laughs> but hey, incumbency advantage, did Herbert Hoover have an incumbency advantage? <laughs> right. I mean, really. Uh, in fact, when I wrote the book, I didn't know about the, the virus and I didn't know about the unemployment that would follow. And therefore, I was, wasn't as certain about the Senate. I knew that uh, a Democrat would get elected with at least 52 or 53 percent of the vote. But now what we have, as we know, uh, throughout the country, even in Texas, where they discover they're not made of stainless steel, uh, they are beginning to discover that the current administration is not up to governing. I mean, we elected somebody, we elected the system, elected somebody who was a very good politician. He was a fantastic camp campaigner. He really was. And he did really great work on that. And he got 62 million votes, which got him enough of the electoral college to get in. But he's not set up to govern the country. He doesn't know how to. And as a result, when this virus came along, it pulled the rug out of from under completely. So nobody wants to stay the course with a loser, which is what he is. Uh, it's very compelling what you're saying about why we wouldn't want to stay the course with Trump. However, oh, so let me put in. The maybe it'll mobilize his base. Maybe there will be um, a backlash on race as it relates to the protests. Oh, his base is very small. It were, by the way, notice we talk about his base, not about the Republican Party generally, because not all Republicans are in his base. Right, that's and important. A lot of them are, we talk about the college educated suburbanites who are and have been Republicans. They were Romney Republicans. And as I indicated, they went for Trump because they wanted to have a president again. They now tasted the president, and enough of them, not in the special elections and in 2018, just didn't have enough energy to get up and vote for Trump in the midterms, and they won't again in 2020. Now, uh, as far as the base is concerned, I want just let me say one or two things about that. The base, in fact, is a very curious type of Republican base. The vast majority of them are there because the Republican Party has come around to them on two issues that are dear to them, abortion and guns. If you take away abortion and guns from the Republicans, they be hardly a party at all. Huh. And in fact, as you know, in the second half of the book, I have a discussion of the Republican Party and the people who identify as Republicans. And they, in the beginning, of the, I have a one page kind of thing that I call an introduction, I call, preface, I call the Concordat. This is what keeps the Republican Party going. What's the Concordat? The Republican Party first and foremost, is the party of wealth and profits, wealth and profits. But for the people who benefit from wealth and profits, don't carry enough precincts. So the <laughs> yeah, party, that is true. The Republican Party needs more ground troops. So what they have discovered is that guns and abortion are the way to get their ground troops. Right. And the agreement is the wealth and profits people don't criticize closing of Planned Parenthood clinics or uh, assault weapons in every closet. They keep quiet on that because they're getting their wealth and profits. The guns and abortion people keep quiet when a tax bill goes through that helps only the top one half of 1%. 
and that's it. Now, uh, I, this is not the time to go and ask why guns and abortion are so important for so many Americans. It's a fantastic story. I, I talk about it a bit in the book. I can't hear. So, but at all events, what Trump will get, and these are the people who come to his rallies, by the way, they're the guns and the abortion people. Right. And all he has to say is life, just that one word, and you hear the cheers, they know why they're there. Second Amendment, cheers, they know why they're there. Mm -hmm. And, but there aren't enough of them to carry the electoral college this time. They need the suburban types, they're not going to be there. And you know, that clearly is a very, very compelling argument. And I thought the section of the book that was about the Republican Party was very revealing and very important uh, for everybody to read. So I, I do want to ask you a small question about that before we get back to the questions I know that are on everybody's minds, which is really about it's about both how you collected the data for the book, but also because, oh, you know, you trained me. I'm a political scientist. I can't help it. You did something really interesting in this book. Uh, uh, you know, I sort of thought about it as a kind of shock and awe approach to data analysis. The, it, the book is just filled with ex every different type of data that, you know, anyone could imagine in making your case that Trump can't win again, and, and that, as you said, the Republican Party uh, is a complex party, and um, not all Republicans share the same set of views. But then you went and you put a message on the internet asking Republicans to explain why they're Republicans. And so I'm wondering, what did you find out anything in that set of requests that were different from the public opinion data or that somehow elucidated what we know from the public opinion data in a different way. Uh, I didn't really, you know, you, I loved what you did in using the quotes, but I know there's so much more there that you probably didn't get a chance to present in the book. Okay. What I did was I got in touch with a couple of Republican websites. They're out, they're out there. And I put out a message. I said, I'm writing a book about you. And I asked, <laughs> would you tell me, long or short, just tell me why you are a Republican? That's all I asked them. And then I asked them to put down the state that you're in. And I got back within a week over a thousand replies. Some long, very short. So in the part of the book where I discuss the Republican Party, it's about 100 pages long, at the bottom of each page, I put one of the excerpts that I got from people who told me why they're Republicans. So let, let me read a few of them that were at the bottom of the pages. I'm quoting individual Republicans, what they said. One said, climate is always changing. It's being used as a Trojan horse for a global agenda. Another said, I am sick and tired of being called a racist. Another said, People who go light on birth control should live with their consequences. Another says, as a taxpayer, I don't want to pay for abortions. Another, I go to a shooting range once a month. <laughs> well, I listened to these thousands of people as if they were talking to me. And I got a feel for what leads people to vote Republican. Now, some do it on economic grounds, but most of them, they kept coming back as we said, to guns and abortion. Now, is this a scientific survey? Of course not. But it's a thousand people that I've been listening to. And you don't get that from a poll. You don't get that from 37.2%. Right. But it seems like it was fairly consistent with the poll data, right? I mean, in terms of identifying what was important to them for those who responded to you. It didn't seem like you got many of the, you know, tax and wealth folks responding from these websites, but rather it was really the manly men, as you talk about them in the book, and the guns and uh, anti-abortion crowd. Well, yes, and by the way, uh, one of them, one of the replies said, I always keep a gun in my purse. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> uh, 
But there's one, there was one problem though, one deficiency with my method of asking people why I'm Republican, and that's race. Only one out of a thousand said, I'm a Republican because it's the white man's party. Only one said that. Wow. Now a lot of others said, I get riled up about this race thing. Black people should take care of their own problems, you know, all that sort of thing. But that's one place where they didn't commit themselves. But still we know, and I have a, by the way, there's a chapter in the book, it's called a white haven uh, as the Republican Party. I called it originally a Caucasian haven, but my editors took it out. They thought that was too sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> But the Republican Party is a white party. It's a party where white people feel safe. They feel it's their party. And Donald Trump, you know, certainly has taken advantage of that. You, you also say it's, it's a man's party. And the gender gap issue is increasing, uh, it seems to me, as time goes on in terms of the Democratic and Republican Party. Is that going to be important again in 2020? Uh, it's amazing on this. The electorate is now about 52% women. Really, 52% women. So that's an age. Democratic voters are 57% women. You know, yeah. uh, imagine that. You know, 57% women, <laughs> 43% men. I mean, who would have imagined a national party would have that breakdown? And indeed it does. And of course, uh, there are Republican women. I, I say quite a bit about them. And by the way, a lot of them replied to me. So they are there, but it's still a man's party. And as we know, if you look in the Senate, the House of Representatives, governorships, uh, there are Republican women, but not that many. I, I want to ask you one last question um, about the relationship between your book and some new things that are happening now. Um, you know, most of the people on this webinar have probably read the New York Times in the last two days, and a new poll just came out. And I'm wondering if you think this current public opinion data is, you know, consistent with your findings. One of the things that struck me that was a little concerning was the data on the economy, that the majority of Americans still think that Trump is a better steward of the, would be a better steward of the economy than Biden. Although on the other indicators, it's a uh, quite a different story. But so what is your sense of where the public is now and whether or not, if it's against Trump, if the tide is against Trump, whether that will get maintained over the course of the next four months. Uh, remember back to Professor Woodworth of Columbia. <laughs> I'm not interested in what people tell pollsters. Uh, by the way, do you know at a certain point early in the campaign, Michael Dukakis was ahead. Uh, you know, there we go. Until, uh, he, until he took that, did that commercial with the tank, right? And little yeah. Pete, yeah. Not yeah. a good look for Michael Dukakis. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, no, I'm not interested in, in, in what people say to pollsters. And so, uh, for example, the, what was it, what is the Times one today? Uh, is O'Biden 56%? Yeah. I mean, really, uh, since I think Reagan's second term, he got as much as 57%. Is right. that but nobody's got up to 56% now. No, it's not going to happen that way. Um, Maybe 55. Obama got up to 55. Uh, we'll see on this. And by the way, I have a real hunch there aren't going to be third party candidates. Uh, right. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. They still have time to get on the ballot, but we'll see on that one. On this though, though, yes, they can say Donald Trump or Republicans are better on the economy because of the business party and business people know about how our economies work. Democrats have never, you know, claimed to be good about economics, really. They're good about getting to, uh, out of the recessions and depressions. So at all events, I'm not worried about that because the major part of the electorate has made up its mind and are not going to change their minds. 
Right. So you're, yeah, I mean, that's pretty clear that you think this is, this is uh, enduring now that, that uh, the public seen him in office, but a couple of the people on the seminar have expressed some concerns, as you might imagine, and they've pointed out a couple of areas where they are, where they are specifically can see possible uh, impact on the election. One is voter suppression. The other is Fox News. And then the third is tax cuts. So these are sort of in the bag of tricks, right, that are out there still, are three very compelling and uh, interesting tools that Donald Trump has in his uh, tool bag. Now, Esther, did I hear right? Was the third one tax cuts? Yes, tax cuts. The fact that he, that was the third one. Uh, I, tax cuts are for corporations, for investors. Okay. The top one percent. The top one percent. That's correct. If so, any, but could, that could impact this. You know, the the rich and and uh, well-to-do folks who supported Trump the first time. It's sort of we have to assume that something else is going to motivate their vote this time, other than the self-interest that has continued to motivate their vote over time. Okay, read to me again, Esther. What so here are the three. Voter suppression, okay. Fox News, you take them one at a time, okay. and tax cuts or okay. economic policy is probably a better way to put it. Okay, let's, let's take Fox News. Yep. Uh, I, I must confess that I'm not a Trump fan, but I'm the only person who has my general political sympathies who watches Fox News. <laughs> I watch Fox News all the time because I get data from it about who Republicans are and who the Trump people are. But the only people who watch Fox News are the already converted. And even Tucker Carlson at a good night won't even get six million votes as people. I was about to say votes. You know, six million at most. And they are converted, what they used to call the Amen Corner. You know, people who say amen, amen, everything that Hannity, Laura Ingram, you know, all of them do. So Fox News doesn't persuade anybody at all. And as far as voter suppression is concerned, yes, we're going to see a good example of that in Florida, where convicted felons are going to have to pay thousands of dollars unless courts overturn that it's a law that the step Florida state legislature passed. By the way, we can't even get into this now. Fortunately, between now and election, there are not enough Republican judges to keep voter suppression and things like that intact. And by the way, notice I call them Republican judges. I don't call them conservatives. Uh, there's no such thing. If you take just the uh, decision that we heard about yesterday about Flynn and, you know, whether the Justice Department case against Flynn can be continued. Uh, the Court of Appeals, three people voted two to one, and they talked about the two conservatives <laughs> voted to uphold the Justice Department, the one that was ridiculous, the two Republican Trump appointees did the job for which they were appointed and upheld the Trump Justice Department. How much more of that we're going to see? A good deal. But at this point, Republicans do not dominate fully the federal judiciary. And we can't, don't have time now to get into the Supreme Court, which is fascinating on that score. But at all events, voter suppression, people are going to keep coming back because they want to vote. You've seen them waiting for three and five hours, seen them waiting in the sun, seen them waiting for the virus around. That beats suppression any time. So let's continue, though, in this vein and link up Trump and the Republican Party, because you mentioned this in the context of Republican judges appointed by Trump. There's a broader question that comes from one of my colleagues uh, at SEPA, Paul Lagunas, about the relationship between Trump and the Republican Party, 
which is, you know, they managed to win with Trump. They're clearly, the leadership at least, is standing by him now. And has he had a long-term impact on the Republican Party? And will this invariably then affect the election in some way? Okay, very good question. I have a chapter in the book about Trump, and I think I've titled something, A Very Partisan President. And I go down, just I take all this cabinet, you know, uh, Treasury, uh, Commerce, each, and I show how each cabinet department and each agency, like environmental protection, uh, all the others, have done exactly what Republicans want. Trump, as a Republican president, has delivered for his party, particularly the party of wealth and pop. As far as guns and abortion, he hasn't done that much. There's going to be a real test on abortion with the courts, and we'll see what happens with renegade Roberts, uh, as I'm sure he's regarded now. But still the fact remains, he is a Republican president. Just as Ronald Reagan, who once had been a Democrat, was a Republican president. He's given them what they want. As far as the party itself, once he's defeated, the party's going to have a real problem. There's going to be, what's his name, Josh Hawley from Missouri, the senator. Right. Cotton from Arkansas. Yeah. There's going to be Rubio and uh, Cruz, who are not going to go away. That's all right. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see after, I have to be nice about that, after Joseph Biden is elected with his vice president. I'm a betting man. I'll bet half the House that Biden will abdicate, resign gracefully, and turn over the keys and the nomination to his vice president. I'm taking a deep breath on that one, Mr. Hacker. He better choose a good vice president. Usually they don't really count that much, but this time I think they do. I think you're right. We have like uh, a couple more questions. I want to get to them before we run out of time. So um, putting two together as it relates to the Republican Party and issues, which you cover extensively in the book, but the two that have been brought up in our questions ha have to do one with white supremacy and the other with anti-LGBTQ culture. Um, is that going to have traction in the Republican Party? And will his white supremacy mobilize his base? Now, this is fascinating to me. And as you know, in the book, I have whole chapters on race in the Republican Party and also on sex or sexuality or whatever. Cause various things. Okay. The country has changed. If we take white people, you know, Caucasians, people like you and me, yes, uh, you know, that's, we pass as white. <laughs> I'm not touching that. Uh, for a lot of white people, being white doesn't matter that much to them. That's one of the reasons they have no problem joining in with the Democrats because the Democrat is very much a multi-racial party. In fact, at the Democratic Convention in 2016, a third of the Democrats were black or Hispanic, you know. So there are more and more, including young people, white people, who don't make a big deal about me being white and the white being a white country and all the rest. That group is diminishing year by year. And there's still some, like those who show up at Charlottesville, but not as many. Same thing is true with sexuality. Not lots, in fact, lots of white people are kind of pro-gay. They see that gay America has added so much in terms of a kind of joie de vivre, hey, that's gay, to uh, the country. So there's, when gay marriage and can't fire people, call that. Lots of people who are straight say that's fine with me. And that group is growing also. So Trump's base, which is 
so important to be heterosexual. At least, they must be more straight, heterosexual, whatever. Or so important to be white. They're there, but not as many as used to be. Each year, there are fewer of them. This is, you know, I think this relationship between Trump and the Republican Party is really important, and I and I really encourage everybody to get the book for multiple reasons, but to read that part about who Republicans are, how do they uh, how do they talk about themselves these days, and what issues motivate them, and if we connect that now back to the 2020 race, one of one of our uh, attendees on the webinar. Uh, I think has a really important question to bring up, which has to do with the protests. And they're asking, you know, um, even if we assume that there are good reasons for the protest, won't the, quote, law and order issue hurt the Democrats the way it did uh, when Nixon won in 68? So a little historical perspective here from one of our webinar attendees. Okay, that was 68. What was 68? 32, 42, 52 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Next Amendment's law and order and all that. By the way, in the protest marches, did you notice how many white people were there? Yes, including my, my sons <laughs> and daughter. <laughs> and in some parts of the country, it was almost all white because there were parts of the country with very few black people. And what I, here, here's an example. Let's try this. Trump tried in 2018 to frighten people by saying, there's an invasion coming across the southern border. To recall, just before the 2018 elections, Trump sent troops down to the border. He said, be terribly frightened. People weren't frightened. You know, he lost the House of Representatives and he lost the referendum on himself by the biggest margin possible. Same thing here. Nobody likes looting, you have to say that. Nobody likes arson, of course. But actually, compared with some previous times, say the Rodney King and the, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, far less of that. And yeah. by the way, I do, we do know that in New York, at least, where the looting took place, a lot of it was white guys in New Jersey who drove in to pick the windows and take the stuff back because in order to loot properly, you have to have a car to take your stuff back. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. I don't, I don't see the protests playing out in the same way as they did in 68. Uh, and you're, I think it's important that you point out this is definitely a multicultural, multi-ethnic group of protesters. And young people have a very important role here, which is to say, that's also one of the concerns that are being brought up by our uh, webinar attendees, which is, will young people, do we, well, it's two questions, really. Will young people turn out for Joe Biden? And does it matter whether they turn out or they don't turn out? No, that's, I think, fascinating question. Uh, in 2018, uh, election, I asked my class, by the way, I'm still, you said emeritus. I'm still teaching. Yes, I, I meant to say you're still teaching, okay. but you could still have emeritus status, right? Of course, but I'm only doing it for the money. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I asked, here's a class of 35 students. So I said, I'm going to give you election day off. This was two years ago. I'm going to give you election day off. And then give me a, one piece of paper the next day, which is, if you voted, I don't want to know who you voted for, but tell me about the voting experience. And if you didn't vote, will you tell me why you didn't vote? This was Queens College. They were all old enough to vote. Half of them did not vote. And I realize New York is a safe territory, but even so, half didn't vote. Today's young people are moral, but they're not political. They, they're not ready to organize. If you ask them to cast an after these ballots, in the end, they couldn't find a stamp. You know? <laughs> and by the way, that was two, in 2000, not just my class, but nationally in 2018. Young people did not vote either. So, but it doesn't matter because there are enough people over the age of, let's say, 27 
who are going to go out to vote. Uh, the young people today will start voting by the time they're 26 or 27, but it's going to take a while. Uh, video games take up a lot of time. Well, I think the young, young people are important, but what we're seeing in the new poll data uh, is that the older voters who tend to turn out more than younger voters, they seem to be shifting. And if that continues, that is very bad news for Donald Trump. Um, and that was in the New York Times poll. And I don't know, you know, to what extent um, the older voters who supported Trump were regionally and racially specific. Uh, I don't know if you had data on that, but is that something that Democrats have to think about and target more effectively? Okay, back to my mantra. I'm not interested in the polls or what people tell us. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> how they vote. And just because people vote Democratic doesn't mean they become Democrats. Right. And we, we used to see that, remember, when uh, Obama got in in 2008, the midterms two, year, two years later, 2010, where were all his supporters? Well, they hadn't become Democrats. We're going to find out whether more people become Democrats. By the way, it's not as easy. If I got in touch with a thousand Demo people who voted Democratic and asked me to write out little statements as to why they're Democrats, they'd be hard pressed to talk. Yeah. You know, for example, Republicans are against immigration. What are Democrats? They're not for immigration, but they're for fairness. Democrats need paragraphs to explain their position. <laughs> you can do it, you know, on a thumbnail. Yeah, maybe that's why they have a problem with the slogan, you know, make America great again. What was the Democratic version of that? But was, that gets was, me to, to Hillary Clinton, was, which is not a big part of your book, but there are several questions here. So I'm going to ask you anyway, because frankly, I'm personally curious too which is, was the victory of Donald Trump from, from your perspective partly attributable to dislike? I don't want to use some of the words that are in, in my uh, feed over here. Dislike of Hillary Clinton, as opposed to actual support for Donald Trump. Okay, uh, I know this is much in the air. There's a lot of talk about how people did not like Hillary Clinton. No, I think that's misperception. Hillary Clinton, you know, what's dislikable about her? Okay, she's entitled, but so Donald Trump felt he was entitled to, you know, so it's not that. Hillary was Hillary, and there was no spark to her. She didn't have a vision for America. Donald Trump had a vision. Make yeah. it be great again. And she was just simply saying, I'll do more of saying she's a policy wonk. Okay. And by the way, it would have been nice to have a policy wonk during the virus because that's what we needed. No, she did her best, but she couldn't win. Even if she had gone to Wisconsin, I'm not even sure she would. But, and wow. So, okay. One last question here about... Um, the election itself and the Republicans that seem to be on people's minds, which is dirty tricks. Are, is there anything that you foresee that Republicans can do to actually impact uh, this election in a way that, you know, that doesn't come from your data? I know, and you know, a dirty trick could be going to war with Iran, you know. Uh, at this point, people have made up their minds. You know, we used to say uh, people would make up their minds two weeks before our election. Now they've made up their minds five months before the election. Hmm. Certain on that. So what could be a dirty trick? Well, he tried to send troops down to the border. You know, that didn't work. And at this point, apart from starting a war, wow. Apart from that, I can't see anything that would change the game. 
Okay, my last question for you. Uh, so I don't remember you as somebody who goes out on a limb with predictions, although you w go out on a limb with interesting and provocative opinions. I've seen that many, many times. And of course, you turn out to be largely right, you know, which is always uh, something that everybody has to keep bear in mind here. But why, I mean, you are so confident in a way that makes people nervous, you know? People looked at the poll data and they were confident that Hillary was gonna win. You know, people are mentioning that as if almost this is an evil eye we're gonna project onto this race by actually looking at your data and acknowledging its power and um, validating your prediction. So what's, why did you decide to go all the way out on that limb and predict rather than just presenting the data and the argument? Okay, I'm a tea leaf reader. And in April of 2017, April of 2017, Trump had been in the White House for about 80 days, only 80 days, less than three months. There was a special election in Kansas. And I found myself looking at the figures there. And I said, this can't be right. This can't be Kansas. Do you know in Kansas last since a senator, a Democratic senator, Kansas, 1936. <laughs> Yet in Kansas, there was a surge of votes against Donald Trump, you know, uh, 80 days in August. And I said, so I kept following elections like that in South Carolina, in Utah, in Pennsylvania, and I discovered that building up. So I said to myself, no, this man slipped in. Remember, 77,000 votes. Right. He cannot do it again. I don't think it's a prediction. I think it's just looking at the data and the data only admitted of that one conclusion. Wow. I think, I think I'm going to take that as, as the last word. What an exciting conversation. I feel personally honored to have done this uh, this afternoon and we had tremendous questions from our webinar participants. So I want to thank all of them for sending in these great questions, but especially thank you, Mr. Hacker. Uh, this has just been a great pleasure. And personally, I hope you're right. So wow. thanks everybody. We'll see you again soon and uh, have a great day. Take care. Okay. You're very welcome. And you're still my best student. Oh, God, I've never heard that in all these years. The best day ever. <laughs> <laughs>